Welcome, Dr. James Beckett, Sports Card Insights. I am going to do a Valentine's Day episode today, but it's not what you think because I could spend easily 15 minutes talking about my uh, awesome wife, but she actually would not like that. She'd prefer a more private center of attention. She is worthy of honor to the fullest extent, but I'm taking a little bit different tack. This is a Valentine's Day love letter that I received that everybody else received, I think, if I can couch it in that way, from Josh Luber. The trading cards are cool again, manifesto. He's a sharp guy. He's a passionate guy, an excellent writer. And it's just like if you get a love letter three months ago, because this was in November, and then I read it then, and then I reread it again, just like you would with a love letter. This guy loves the hobby. He loves the industry. He loves sneakers. He loves cards. And uh, I'm excited about his participation, and especially because he's given a roadmap for how he thinks things could play out. So it's worth reading for every single person in the industry or rereading, again, just a love letter. But I'm not uh, really just responding to Josh here. I'm responding to what he wrote and just have a few comments that for anybody, if you're in this industry, uh, Josh is absolutely an influencer and somebody that's going to put his uh, stamp on it. So I'm excited about that. But I did want to address some of the things. I'm not going to go point by point of his 50-something pages. But as I said, I think it's worth reading a lot of history. Again, the hobby is past, present, and future. You ignore the past, that's not good. And these uh, fanatics and others need to be very aware that the future is in the hands of the present. We could mess it up, and I hope we don't. Okay, I had seven points here to address. Again, thank you, Josh, for uh, presenting the information in, in an excellent way. But the first point, it isn't your point uh, as much as it's something that you're quoting, but the 81 billion cards that were produced per year in the early 90s, that probably is pretty accurate. I, I don't remember the original source of that. And he mentions that would be 300 for every person in America. And of course, it, it, it's a worldwide hobby. And if it, instead of 300 for every person, man, woman, and child. Let's just do 600 cards for every male person in the USA. But that's not the full story. To me, if that is the case, and I have no reason to believe it's untrue, those 600 cards for every male, what does that represent? Cards in those days were a penny or two. Or If I just take two and a half cents per card for back in the day, which is what they were, SRP, you'd buy packs, it just wasn't very expensive. So that 600 cards for each male is 15 bucks worth of retail value of cards or of card value when they get it out of the packs. Again, that comports with, if it's two and a half cents, that would mean the industry had annual sales of uh, a penny, it's $810 million. Two cents is 1.62 billion and uh, two and a half cents is 2 billion in total annual sales of the industry. That's global and that includes that current year cards. So let's just say that's what it is back in the day. That's 81 billion cards to get to $2 billion. So remember that. So if you fast forward 25 or 30 years and come today, the new card market I think is still is $2 billion. It's back to being 2 billion, which is not bad news. I'm figuring 500 million from Tops annually, a billion from Panini, and then 500 million from Upper Deck Leaf and others. So that's 2 billion in annual sales sales, but that's not based on 81 billion cards. In fact, it's it's a fraction of the 81 billion cards. So just for sake of simple math, let's just say the average card now is no longer one or two and a half cents. It's more like a dollar. So if you had a, a dollar card SRP, in other words, if you bought a box and it had uh, 100 cards in it, you, you wouldn't be shocked that it was $100 for the box. Hence, an average of a dollar per card. Again, premium products, much more, but some of the other uh, popular products can be less. But if I did that math, uh, it means that to get the $2 billion of new card sales, it's only 2 billion cards being produced, not 81 billion. And so there aren't an overproduction of cards, but there's still the same amount of money that's chasing those better cards. But again, when you divide it up by the number of people in America, and again, it's I mentioned it as a global industry, that's only like 12 cards per person, per male, which is like one pack. So the hobby is not saturated now. There's a lot of dollars going into it, but not a lot of cards are being chased compared to 25 or 30 years ago. And another way to look at it is that the industry capacity for grading is 20 million cards a year. And if there's 2 billion cards being produced each year, just brand new cards, 
then 1% are being graded. It's actually less than that. So you can look at these numbers more than one way. Again, Josh really opened the door. Number two was uh, the whole idea of smart money coming into the category. I used to think that's what we needed. Now I'm thinking based on jo uh, Josh's uh, approach is that smart money is not as important coming into the category as fame. How the investor got his wealth or her wealth, what the investor's track record is not as important as whether or not they're, it's better to be famous than smart. Because if you're a social media, if you're an influencer, just the fact that you're jumping in and lending your name to something makes it bigger. It's like a party. You, you tell everybody who else is coming to the party. They want to come to the party because of the other people that are there. And that it all sounds great. Number three was his situation about the low cost basis, not base cards, but the low cost basis of cards. As they keep coming out, they can flood the market. And certainly if they all come out at once, they can they can flood the market. But what's fueling this hot market is the fact that there's a lot of these low-cost cards that were primarily purchased a long time ago that people are willing to release them into the auction space. And those sellers, a lot of them are my age uh, or are older, who've had cards for a long time. Uh, there have to be a reason, though, they're taking their profits. Uh, they must be thinking that now's the time to sell. And so if they think the time is now to sell, the time is ripe, and they didn't pay very much for the card, then they're going to keep putting them into the auction. And when that stops, now you're going to find out, okay, there's there, when you have no more supply or low-cost supply, then we'll find out what happens when that sends the, the prices further up. Number four was what I think is the conventional wisdom that there's a decreasing number of high-end bidders every time a big card sells. So there's one less bidder. Two guys bid on it. One guy wins. Next auction, he or she is not going to bid because he already got it. I'm here to tell you that based on my many decades of experience, that certainly used to be true. I don't think that's true anymore. In fact, it could be wildly inaccurate and misleading. But what we have today in the 21st century is the publicity from the huge sale draws in an additional bidder, an additional two bidders, an additional three, ten. Who knows? When the publicity that some of these glamour cards have gotten, even if it was a bidding war between two wealthy people, there are other wealthy people find out about it. And uh, so I don't think it's necessarily true that if you're the underbidder, you're going to just get an easy ride the next time the card comes up. You may find that there's some additional uh, competition. So I'm here to say that conventional wisdom may be changed. Number five was about eBay comps and uh, mentioning that some of the movies movement in the market over the course of the last 18 months I had to do with card shows being held and other kinds of things like that. But I think the whole idea of eBay comps, nobody talks about card show comps. When you go to a card show and I'm just minding my own business, there's a lot of sales going on of people walking up to dealers and wanting to buy and they they're willing to take 60 or 70 percent of the latest eBay comp. And eBay fees are a headache. There's uncertainty, unpleasantness. But still, do you really want to take a 30 or 40 percent haircut just for having the card right there, especially if it's graded? Apparently, people want to do that, but then they don't factor that in to the value basis of that card. It's what's the eBay comp and go to a card show. You can't get that. Number six was the idea, it was a footnote, an important footnote that Josh had about research in markets, a research organization estimating the global market going from 4.7 billion in 2019 to 62 billion in 2027. And hence, fanatics of bullishness. If I read that and fully believed that the market was going to go 13 times bigger in the next uh, seven years, six years now, I would be all over it. And, and they are. But that 4.7 million from 2019, I think just like the 2 billion from this past year is on current products. So the 4.7 billion in 2019, I think my estimate on that is that maybe 25% of that was current year product and 75% was the uh, secondary sales in prior years and other ways cards are, are bought and sold. And so if you think there's going to be a 13-fold increase to $62 billion, which would just be amazing, the mix of that $62 billion estimate, I haven't read the original paper, but I think the percentage of dollars that are going into new product as opposed to prior years seems like it just automatically has to be increasing because there's more and more prior year cards, and then every year you get the current year. And so I'm thinking that the mix of the $62 billion in 2027 could wind up being 90-10, that 90% of it will be old cards. Again, last year's cards, the year before, not extremely old, but not 
brand new cards with about $6 billion for current year. Now, still, that's triple this past year, and that's a healthy increase, a dramatic increase. But $56 billion for prior years, that is where the growth it could be astounding. And that needs to happen in a healthy, broad-based hobby. It's based on today uh, and yesterday and tomorrow that there's nostalgia. And uh, finally, Fanatics and Josh, obviously, they're smart. They want a big piece of the $56 billion pie, not just the $6 billion new card pie. That's why secondary sales and uh, the customer experience are, are very important to them. And then finally, Josh had a nice riff on uh, ROI, you know, return on investment, different ways to look at it. I've always said that the expected ROI, the mathematical expected value, kind of the average and the mean, when you see what you could get and divide by you know, what to the, the chances of getting it, what has happened over the last couple of years is occasionally that expected value, that ROI can be greater than the cost of the product. And if so, people are buying up as many as they can. Now that's driven up the price. And so that doesn't happen very much anymore. And it's more the typical ROI, what Josh calls the typical ROI, is what you usually get. And it reflects the value of the cards you get when you don't get the hit, uh, because you usually don't. If everybody got it, it would be too good a deal. And again, the expected value would be greater than the cost and, and, and then it'd be sold out. I like the way Josh allows for the enjoyment of the experience as well as the upside emergence of late developing obscure players. Um, so all is not lost. If you buy a box and you don't get what you perceive as your money's worth, the money's worth, you got the chance to get something huge. You didn't get it. And so what you were left with, your consolation prize, you still got the enjoyment, as Josh said. And you may have, if you are not too dismissive of players that you haven't heard of yet, they may still yet catch on. Still, the, the driving force for ROI is you hear about somebody opening a spot in a break or opening a box or a case, and you hear about the huge hit, and you think that could be me. So again, that's part of the, the fun, the dynamic element of the hobby. Again, thank you on this Valentine's Day, Josh, of reminding us of many reasons why we love it. You had lots of choices of what to do with your time and the fact that you're jumping in with both feet to our industry. I'm happy and I wish you uh, great success because if you have great success, we're all going to have great success. Thanks, everybody, and have a happy Valentine's Day. Like I said, I'm going to honor my true love and I hope you will too. But um, hobby is not my number one love, but it's uh, certainly an enduring love as well. So thanks, everybody, and I'll be back tomorrow.